will now conduct the humor speech contest. If you use your cell phone during the break, please turn it off. <laughs> Once the contest has begun, Sergeant Arms will secure the door. Please stay remain seated until the contestant has begun his uh, speaking. After the contest, please do not leave the room until the ballots have been collected. I'd like to now announce the speaking order for the humor speech contest. Contestant number one is Luann Schipperdecker. Contestant one is Luann Schipperdecker. Contestant number two is David Williams. Number two is David Williams. Contestant number three is Russ Little. Number three is Russ Little. We'll now proceed with the humor speech contest. There'll be one minute of silence for the first contestant and also between each contestant. Timekeepers, I'll ask you to signal me when one minute is up after each, each contestant. And then after all the contestants have been spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to finish the ballot. <laughs> Contestant number one, Luann Schipperdecker. Contestant, it's not my fault. It's not my fault, Luann Schipperdecker. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests. Last year, I turned 50. It was a time for me for reflection, for me to think about who am I? Why am I? Mostly, why am I the way I am? And I decided I have a horrible personality. That's my husband. He <laughs> says, I roll my eyeballs at people. I interrupt. I'm not sympathetic. And our kids echo his uh, same feelings. They say, gosh, Mom, you're not very warm and cuddly. So, I've decided to do the only sensible thing that a person can do. I've decided to accept my faults, embrace my problems or my issues, and blame them on someone else. <laughs> no, that someone is not my mother. That someone is my grandmother, a 97-year-old Swedish farmer. Let me tell you about Grandma. She kind of reminds me of an old horse. You know, you see an old nag in a field, you drive along the road, you feel kind of sorry for it. But you know if you get too close, the damn thing's going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> the first memory of my Grandma is when I was a little girl. I must have been about five years old, and I had very blonde hair, and I was in the farmhouse. And she had brown hair. And she said, come over here. And I got close, and she plopped a brown wig on my head. She said, mm-hmm, just what I thought, you'd be much cuter as a brunette. <laughs> Leave that thing on your head. <laughs> now, in between driving the tractor and racing in the house to make lunch, Grandma had a few minutes to get caught up on her favorite soap operas. Her favorite soap opera was The Party Line. For anybody who doesn't remember, in the 60s, you could still pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation on the party line. So Grandma knew pretty much everything that was going on with every family in the neighborhood. And she got really busy. She'd say, here, you listen. <laughs> so as an eight-year-old, I knew who's, how the affair was going and who was drinking too much. And then I had to report back to Grandma so she didn't miss an episode of her favorite show. <laughs> Grandma said, <clears throat> Annabelle was an old maid. She had a proposal. She turned it down. Big mistake. <laughs> Annabelle's mother was Annie Bergstrom. And Annie Bergstrom was quite large, and she had a lot of health problems. Grandma said she had dropsy, and she had this huge goiter on her neck. Grandma said, come to think of it, goiters were in back then. Like it was a fashion statement or something. 
<laughs> but when Annabelle, when Andy died, Annabelle and Frank moved into town. So Grandma and Grandpa would go up there every Sunday before church and they'd have sweet rolls and coffee. Swedes eat a lot of sweets. So we'd eat our sweet roll and our coffee and we'd race off to church because you have to get your certain place in the pew because God forbid somebody's sitting in your spot, all hell's going to break loose. So we'd be sitting in our spot in the pew. And Annabelle was quite large. My grandma was no uh, skinny man. Uh, but we'd be sitting in the pew, and, and in those days, all women were hoes. So you would hear Annabelle's approach. In the vestibule, you could hear,
Contestant number two, David Williams, NTAS, okay. NTAS, David Williams. But in man time, 
We know what that means. That means that you need to multiply that number by four and then carry a one. <laughs> it means that in the amount of time that it's taking her to actually get ready, you could have called and ordered yourself dinner, went and picked it up, eaten it, and put the rest of the food away. <laughs> So now we're sitting downstairs, patiently waiting. At this point, we don't even care if we're wrinkled anymore. We just slouch over the couch, hands up like this. We don't care. It doesn't even matter at this point if we get to dinner on time. We just want to leave and go outside. When all of a sudden she comes down and she asks the one question that no man in his life should ever be presented with. Should I take the shoulder bag or should I carry the clutch purse? <laughs> Now, look at his face. At this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, I've married probably the slowest person in this classroom. He's not the brightest apple in the barrel. Or maybe I should have listened to my mother and married the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Because he's suffering from the not this again syndrome, a syndrome that has gone misdiagnosed by all women and not even known to men. Again, as much as we want to help you decide between this little clutch bag that holds nothing at all and this shoulder bag that looks like you're going out of town, <laughs> we can't. And here's the reason why. There's two reasons. Due to the lack of mental ability, that's the number one reason. And the second reason is that look at our wallets. I've had this same wallet since I've been with my wife for 13 years. <laughs> This wallet only has a few items in it. My driver's license, an insurance card, and it has $2 left remaining from the last time I went to the ESPN zone. I have that card in here. How are we gonna help you pick out a purse? How? How can we help you pick out a purse when we can't even buy an updated wallet? So the next time, you, the next time you're faced with that decision and he looks confused, this straw or in disbelief, don't fall for it. He doesn't know any better. He suffered from the not this against <coughs> him. Thank you. Thank you. Can we please have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Judge, you had 60 seconds to mark your ballot. I had a time when you signaled me, so one minute left. Next up is contestant number three, Russ Whittle, driving in Ireland. Driving in Ireland, Russ Whittle. Fellow Toastmasters, honored guest, who here has visited Ireland? Have you driven in Ireland? <laughs> has anybody seen National Lampoon's European vacation? Okay, very good. 1992, my sister was getting married to an Irishman. At that time, the U.S. government frowned on allowing Irish people into America because they had a habit of not going back. <laughs> so, my entire family, friends, family, all had to go to Ireland for the wedding. I thought, I'm going to take advantage of this. I'm going to go and sightsee around Ireland while I've got the opportunity. So, I go into the Avish rental car, I whip out my American Express, sign up for a car. They give me this bright red, brand new Nissan Sunny, which is like the equivalent to a Corolla here. And so 
I get the keys, I go to get in the car, there's no steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Look to the side, get out of the car, go around, get into the car, and it's a standard. I've got to drive lefty, shifting gears in Ireland, and I'm thinking, is my brain going to be able to handle this? Well, I, I hop in the car, I start it up, and I grind those gears until I get it in there, and I get out on the street. And I start driving along, I'm driving down the street. I'm thinking, I've got a taxi for tires. <laughs> I've just left and I've got a taxi tire. I keep on driving. And then I realize it's not a tack. I'm looking back. I have clipped every side mirror going down the street. <laughs> a mile of mirrors shattered. <laughs> I think I've got an opportunity here. I can either turn back, inform all these people whose cars I've hit parked on the side of the road, or I can enjoy my trip. <laughs> what do you think I did? I enjoyed my trip. So I continued on driving down the street, making sure I was far enough to that center line that I wasn't clipping mirrors anymore. I came up to the green, and the green had a roundabout. I don't know how familiar you are with roundabouts. I actually lived in Boston at the time, and Boston is a roundabout city, which, if you've seen a, uh, National Lampoon's Vacation, Chevy Chase is just going around in a circle, around the Arctic Triangle, just round and round. I get out there in that circle, and I'm going around, trying to get off to my exit, but I can't because there's cars in the way. I keep on going around. <laughs> I'm going around, and then finally, I've got to just throw caution to the wind. I throw my car over there. Oh, smack. I hit another car. Front quarter panels just smashed. Pull off to the side. He pulls off to the side. I'm ready to rumble. You know, this is Boston. I'm from Boston. I'm ready to just go fist to cuss with this guy. <coughs> Gets out and he's like, realizes I'm an American. Oh, no problem. No problem. It's just a little dent in the problem here. I'm thinking, Boston, we need fighting right now. <laughs> and I was ready for it, but he was so nice. Patrolman comes over. I'd like to see your uh, license and registration. Takes a look. Oh, you're American. What do you think of Ireland? So far, it's been nice, but this morning's not been too good. And he's like, well, it's no problem. We'll just have you written up, no problem. Ask the other driver, Patty O'Rear. Couldn't believe it. Patty O'Rear. And the policeman asked him for his license and registration. Don't have it. Left it at home. Not a problem. <laughs> Just come down to the station later on today. We'll take care of it. I'm thinking, this is no way. This is too surreal for, for this possibly to be happening. It's just like the movie. And Patty comes up to me and goes, you know, mate, you're, you're, you're here. Let's go out to the pub. Let's take your car back to Avis and let's go out for a drink. I'm like, still early in the morning, but you know, I'm, I'm not doing too well driving. So, policeman writes everything up. I have it with my paperwork. Drive back to Avis. And they're like, you've only been gone for 30 minutes. <laughs> and then they start walking around the car. The mirror is concaved and hanging. <laughs> the front quarter panel is dented and they look at my paperwork and they say, I, I, I see you paid by American Express. I said, yes. They said, okay. I said, well, membership has its privileges, right? They cover this. And they said, yes, it's all covered. Thank you. So, fast forward 20 years. My sister and brother-in-law go back to Ireland. And they go to rent the car take the family around to Ireland. They go to Avis to rent. Brother-in-law puts down his American Express. They say, we don't cover damage and collision anymore. <laughs> and he blames me. <laughs> <laughs> so, go to Ireland. Remember, you'll have to use your own insurance now. It's not covered by American Express. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Judges, take as long as you need to mark your ballots. When you're finished, hold them up and the ballot counts will collect them.
these hand turned bowls. So we put that with um, the collection is called Holiday Heat, so it's with salsa that also originated right here in Illinois. And then we do jalapeno fudge made by another small business owner. And then we have um, a chili cookbook that was printed and published in Iowa because a lot of books now are printed overseas. And then what else do we have? Sound like quite an entrepreneur. Where do you get into this business? We have gotten a lot of corporate gifts over the years, and I just recognize that people, businesses, are spending a significant amount of money on them. And if they're something that's trite, uh, maybe you know, I hate to disparage anybody else's product, but maybe popcorn or fruit or something like that, maybe the recipients don't truly appreciate the gift, while the business has spent a significant amount of money on that product. And the whole point is you're sending a gift to make a connection, and to send a message to your customers that you care. So I just felt like I could come up with something really meaningful. And we say every gift tells a story. So we have cards in the boxes that tell the story of the product and the artist. So that it has an impact. So it, it tells something to your customer. It tells your customer that you care about creativity, that you care about ingenuity, and that you support local business. It seems like a great idea. Something else I have to ask you about, you won $30,000 in a fast pitch contest? It was um, it, something like Shark Tank, only on a small scale. And it was sponsored by an economic development program in Henry County, Illinois, Henry Stark County. You had five minutes to pitch your business idea. So a score helped me. I went to the retired business so I developed my business plan there, and then my Toastmasters group really helped me prepare. I gave my presentation to them. They were brutally honest. I completely changed my presentation, gave it for this event, and I won. So I won $5,000 in cash and $25,000 in free advertising. I was just about to ask you, have you seen any benefits from Toastmasters with your work? I think you <laughs> Thank you. 
I do have to say, I can sympathize with your not this again syndrome. I believe I have a little bit of it myself. <laughs> My wife has converted our, our towel closet into a shoe closet. It's filled from top to bottom with shoes. And she still doesn't have the right one to wear it she's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually told my wife that the meeting started at noon. That's how we were be here. My deception can be very useful in this situation. All right, David. Well, thank you very much for participating today. I'd like to give you the certificate of participation.
to have any kind of advantage for any of the contestants. There were a couple of other people that were not recognized who are dignitaries. And that is Mike Burnham because his wife was competing. Mike
Without you, we could never put this together and hand it this.